We're now going to do version 2. Before I jump into version 2, I need to explain why, we're, why we can do what we're about to do. Okay? Uh, pens and computers down. Now that you've loaded that up, just put your computer to sleep for a minute and just want full attention. Okay? Don't answer this out loud. I just want you to think about it in your brain. Does it make a difference? If I've got $100. Does it make a difference whether I put all $100 as a lump sum in one bank account or putting 50 here and 50 here, assuming all other things are equal, like the, the interest rate and the compounding and all that kind of thing? Does it make a difference whether I put $100 in one spot or 50 over here and 50 over here? Don't tell me whether it's yes or no. Raise your hand if you have an instinct for which one the answer is. I don't care which one you think it is. Who reckons they think they know what the answer is? I'm not going to ask you what it is. I just want to get a sense of your confidence. A few hands up. Okay, all right, hands down. Let's work out together whether it makes a difference. Okay, so let's suppose there's $50. Let's go with the same interest rate, just for the sake of argument, right? 1.1. Let's put it in for, what did we do? Three years, right? We did three years. So here's one of the bank accounts, right? And it's just getting its interest. And then here is the other one, which, surprise, surprise, is identical, right? What happens when you add them? Well, I've got common factors. The, the interest calculation is a common factor, right? So what you get is this. Do you agree? Now, what this tells you is it doesn't matter where you put your dollars. You don't get some like super bonus by putting them all in one big pile. Actually, every dollar in the account, you could put these in a hundred different accounts. A dollar, a dollar, a dollar. It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't make a difference. Okay. So now version two is going to use that piece of knowledge and it's going to imagine, where'd black go? It's going to imagine, you know how we did, go back to your working, three different deposits. Do you remember that, right? Deposit in the first year, deposit in the second year, deposit in the third year, right? What we're going to do is we're going to treat them as like separate banks, bank accounts, doing their own thing, and then we will recombine them at the end, okay? So what we're going to do, just like before, is we need to define our terms, okay? Now we're doing something different here, right? We're not considering the whole lot, we're considering every deposit separately. So I'm going to say, let D, and I'll put a dollar sign out the front actually, B, the value of the nth deposit at the end of the loan. Okay, let's say this one more time, right? You're, you're depositing money over time. We're just thinking about three years, just to keep it simple. There's going to be D1, that'll be the first deposit, the first year. There'll be D2, the second deposit, the second year, and so on. Okay? So now let's think about each of them. That first deposit, it goes in $100 at the start of the first year. By the end, how long has it been there for? I've actually written up the board because I've been that obvious, right? Isn't it this? It was there at the start, and we went three years. So therefore, it got three interest calculations on it because it makes it through the, the end of three years. Do you agree? So I'm going to say D1 equals this. And now we forget about it. We don't think about it anymore. It's in its own account separately, right? What about the second amount? Well, we put it in 12 months later, right? So it's still $100, but it doesn't have three interest calculations applied to it. How many does it get? gets two. It gets one less than this one, right? So there's two. And then here comes the final one, right? So we're in the final and third year, right? You put that $100 in at the start of the year and it gets a grand total of one interest calculation applied to it. Make sense? So therefore, I just multiply by 1.1 a single time. Uh, you can see the pattern, right? So therefore, I can now say the total is, and I just put them in sequence, right? I'm I find it easier to read if I put them in ascending order, so that makes it reverse chronological, but there you go. And you recognize this line, don't you? Right? We got to this exact same line. I'm not going to do any more working because you know what to do from this point on, right? You identify the GP, use the formula, off you go. Okay? Let me pause for a minute. I'm going to ask you to turn to the person next to you or behind you. 
you've seen version two, you saw version one, which one do you like better and why? Have a chat and then we'll come back together in a minute. That's enough time, you're gonna vote with your fingers. So version one, version two, hold up a fist for me, hold up a fist, all of you. Come on, hold a fist up in the air. And on count of three, I'm gonna ask you to hold up the number of fingers that you felt was the better version, that you prefer anyway, okay? Three, two, one, how many fingers? Huh, interesting. So version one was what we did first, version two. That's a really even split. So interesting, right, hands down, hands down, okay. Um, here's what I'll say, okay. Version two, it's just faster to write. It's just, it's just faster, okay? But it doesn't make as obvious where the GP comes from, right? It just kind of like jump scares you after you've been writing all this stuff, okay? Uh, in version one, it becomes really clear. You build it as you go. That's the cost of writing that extra stuff. But you can see the GP building progressively, okay? Whichever version you like. Like I said, they both get perfect marks. There are three things that we did both times, and I want you to write down, like this is our summary, okay? Uh, and the acronym is a coincidence, but whatever, okay? Step one, whichever approach you take, you must define what terms you're working with, okay? So are you going with AN, like the total amount, right? Are you talking about D, the deposit? Whatever it is, you can't just like throw pronumerals around. You're the one introducing them, so you've got to define them, okay? Second, uh, we did it both times. We went step one, step two, step three. Why were we doing that? What were we trying to show? Why couldn't I just stop at two? Why, why do I not bother going to four? What's special about three? It shows the pattern, right? You are establishing that you know how the pattern builds. And you're not just pulling it out of thin air, right? A lot of the questions you will get asked are, like, they will show you the formula for that final GP, and they'll say, show me why that formula is true, right? So you don't even need to find it yourself. They tell it to you, but they, they need you to do this, okay? Uh, and then, speaking of GP, the last thing you must do is, you must identify that GP clearly. You must write all the terms in such a way that you can see what A is the first term, you can see the ratio, you can see the number of terms in a very obvious way. Whether you go version one or version two, you have to do that. I literally write, this is a GP with. That's how I do my working because I want to make it super obvious, okay? Any questions? Clear?